Welcome to St. John the Evangelist Anglican Church in Ottawa. Welcome St. John's family and friends, and welcome to you if you are visiting with us for worship for the first time. Our worship service takes place in this video and then immediately following on Zoom, and you are welcome to join us for both. As we begin, let us acknowledge that St. John stands on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation, and we recognize the continuing presence of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in this region. May we dwell on this land with respect and peace. This is our service for Ascension Sunday. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Let us pray. Dieu Tout-Puissant, ton Fils Jésus-Christ est monté aux cieux pour y trouver un trône de gloire et régner en Seigneur sur tout l'univers. Garde ton Église dans l'unité de l'Esprit et dans sa paix. Amène la création toute entière à t'adorer par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur qui vit et règne avec toi et l'Esprit Saint, un seul Dieu, pour les siècles des siècles. Amen.
from the letter to the Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe? according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Je vais lire Acte des Apôtres. Le Saint-Esprit promis aux apôtres. Cher Théophile, dans mon premier livre, j'ai rencontré tout ce que Jésus a fait et enseigné dès le début jusqu'au jour où il fut enlevé au ciel. Avant d'y montrer, il donna ses instructions par la puissance du Saint-Esprit à ceux qu'il avait choisi comme apôtres. En effet, après sa mort, c'est eux qui se montrant en leur pouvant de bien des manières qu'ils étaient vivants. Pendant 40 jours, il leur apparut et leur parla du royaume, du royaume de Dieu. Un jour qu'il prenait un repas avec eux, il leur donna cet, cet ordre. Nous vous éloignez pas de Jérusalem, mais attendez ce que le, le Père a promis, le don que je vous ai annoncé, car Jean-Baptiste avec de l'eau, mais vous, dans peu de jours, vous serez baptisé avec le Saint-Esprit. Jésus monte au ciel. Ceux qui étaient réunis auprès de Jésus lui demandèrent alors, Seigneur, en son temps, si que tu établirais le royaume d'Israël, Jésus lui répondit, il ne vous appartient pas de savoir quand viendra le temps et le moment, quand le Père les a fixés de sa seule autorité, mais vous recevrez une force quand le Saint-Esprit descendra sur vous. Vous serez alors mes témoins à Jérusalem, dans toute la Judée et la Samarie, et jusqu'au bout du monde. Après ces mots, Jésus s'élèvera vers le ciel, pendant que tous les regardèrent, puis un nuage le sacha à leurs yeux. Ils avaient encore le regard fixé vers le ciel pour Jésus. S'élevaient quand des deux hommes habillés en blanc se trouvèrent tout à coup près d'eux. Et leur dur homme de Galilée, pourquoi restez-vous là à regarder le ciel ce Jésus qui vous a été enlevé pour aller au ciel reviendra de la même manière que vous l'avez vu y partir. C'est la parole de, Je de Jésus. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. 
Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The colors of the tulips, now blooming in Ottawa, suggest simplicity and peace and serenity. The colors blend and you could pick out one flower, but they all seem to flow together. They are a timeout from the complexity of the world and people coexisting in it. And the world is not simple, it's not serene, and at this time it's also not peaceful. This is Jerusalem Sunday and we originally wanted to dance to Jerusalem. People moving in harmony, in serenity, to soothing words. At least they sound soothing in Zulu. And a first hint of complexity comes when we see the English translation of those words. Jerusalem, my home, rescue me, join me. Don't leave me here. My place is not here. My kingdom is not here. Rescue me, come to me. In other words, Jerusalem is a metaphor for heaven, and that is a long-standing part of our tradition. And it's not by accident when you consider the ancient worldview, which I will show you in two maps. The first map shows that Jerusalem is at the center of the world. This map was by Heinrich Bunting in 1581. And notice there's no Americas or Australia but it is the crossroads and Jerusalem is at the center. The second map shows biblical cosmology, the way the creation story tells it. There are waters below, waters above, land in the middle, and God above the land. And if you put these two maps together, heaven is where God resides and it is closest to Jerusalem. And today, as we observe Ascension Sunday, Jerusalem is at the center of the earth. And Jesus is going to the part of the heavens that is closest to the earth. He's not going far. He told his disciples that he would be with them always, and he's not going far. He also told them to stay in Jerusalem and that they would be clothed with power. And as Jesus leaves them to go up, there are strong echoes of God's power. There are hints of Moses, and maybe you remember, Moses would go up the mountain, and there would be clouds as Moses entered the presence of God. There are hints of Elijah, and maybe you remember Elijah going to the end of his life, accompanied by his assistant, Elisha. And before Elijah ascends into heaven on the fiery chariot, he says to his successor, Elisha, what can I do for you? And Elisha says that he wants a double share of your spirit. Elijah replies, you ask a lot, but if you look up and see me as I go, you will have it. He gets Elijah's mantle. And by the miracles that follow, he also received that double gift of spirit. This is the transfiguration all over again, where the disciples have seen Moses and Elijah with Jesus in the shimmering light. 
and they do receive the mantle of leadership. And Pentecost is going to be about a doubled share of God's Spirit. But first, they spend nine days waiting. We're told they're even rejoicing and in expectation. But also, I think, what about a feeling of absence, of wondering, of confusion? And here is where it gets complicated. This is where Jerusalem is so different from that peaceful garden of tulips. The name Jerusalem means city of peace, but it has been anything but, both in the past and in its present. In the past, it was the crossroads of empire. It was the city where Jesus was killed. And we can variously try to place the blame on the Romans or the Jews or the temple elite, but it gets complicated in trying to untangle what was really going on in such a complex place. And that complexity is true today. Jerusalem is not the center of the world, but it is the center of so much of the world's anxiety. It is the crossroads of religions. It is the crossroads of intergenerational trauma. It's the crossroads of so much media noise that some people try to tune out. Maybe because we feel like we can't do anything about it, or maybe because it's complex. And it can feel like God's absence if you tend to think of God only when you're in serene places. And so today is Jerusalem Sunday, and we are trying to piece it all together. I combine my memories of tourist trips and the connecting Bible stories, but I also want to listen to real people who are expressing their pain. The Palestinian community here in Canada has been trying to get us to pay attention because the human cost has been missing in much of the news. And so, this week there was a statement by the patriarchs of the churches in Jerusalem, and they said, and I quote, the actions undermining the safety of worshipers and the dignity of the Palestinians who are subject to eviction are unacceptable. There was also a petition urged by the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and I quote from this one, this egregious assault during Ramadan by Israeli forces on one of the most inviolable sites for Muslims and their flagrant violation of the human rights of Palestinians under international law must be continuously, categorically condemned. As the week has gone by, leading up to Jerusalem Sunday, I have been wondering, what is the Jewish perspective? And I'm looking particularly for the progressive Jewish perspective, as it has been missing from the media these days. My colleague, the Rabbi Elise Goldstein of City Shul in Toronto said, remember, there are decades of hurts on both sides. Remember that progressive Jews are frustrated with their right-wing hawk head of state who uses crises to get reelected and has never reined in Jewish extremists. And also remember the lack of leadership in the Palestinian territories because of canceled elections. Remember the powder keg of COVID. The Israelis are vaccinated and the country is opening up and people are going to beaches. And the Palestinians are unvaccinated and as frustrated as any of us with our lockdown. I found some further commentary in the Times of Israel. Rabbi Daniel Hartman's blog says, Hamas brilliantly manipulated these events to grab hold of the mantle of Palestinian leadership from the PA the Palestinian Authority, at the time when their ability to do so through the ballot had been denied them due to the yet again postponed Palestinian election. In the Times of Israel, there's also a blog by Bassam Eid, a Palestinian who works in Israel and is therefore not trusted by many Palestinians. His blog is entitled, This Has Nothing to Do with Sheikh Jarrah. Is it, about, it is about Hamas seeing a chance to seize the narrative and increase its own influence and control over Palestinians in Jerusalem. And he gives some of the background. The pretext for the latest missile barrage and social media incitement is Sheikh Jarrah, where a long-standing legal dispute was scheduled for a court hearing. 
This has been a private matter between Jews who have an old property deed from the 1800s and the residents of four homes who have lived there for decades and do not want to pay rent. It is the kind of situation that should have been handled by a local municipal court. This could happen in any other country where there would be no public interest. But this is Jerusalem, and so you have to view everything in the context of the political situation. You also have to ask yourself who stands to gain from political violence right now. My colleague Daniel Michaelberg, the rabbi of Temple Israel in Ottawa, pointed me to the official statement of the President of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, and he writes, We are deeply concerned and pained by the spiraling violence happening over the last several days in Jerusalem and beyond. At this challenging moment, we want to emphasize that attacks perpetuating the cycle of violence delay peace and increase bloodshed. We particularly condemn Hamas's indiscriminate rocket attacks that once again are sowing fear and destruction, even as we condemn the Palestinian Authority's incitement. At this moment, as Israel defends herself from assault, we also urge Israel to protect the freedom of worship of Muslims in the holy month of Ramadan and to use all possible restraint as the Israeli security forces work to address the unrest and violence by Palestinian protesters. We deplore extremists who march with Israeli flags through Jerusalem chanting, Death to Arabs. Theirs is not an expression of restoration and national pride. It is an arrogant expression of extremism and hostility toward others. Evicting Palestinian families from homes that they have resided in for 70 years is unjust at any time and strategically dangerous at this moment. The voices and actions of extremists who seek to polarize, Jewish and Palestinian alike, must not prevail. If you have been following social media, you've probably heard from many other voices, including some of your friends. And so I've heard a few things. I've heard that Palestinians should identify with the indigenous peoples here in Canada, because this is settler colonialism. And I've heard that Palestinians should identify with George Floyd, who was held down for too long and everyone heard him say that he couldn't breathe and the Palestinians can't breathe. I've heard from individuals who have shown the personal cost to them. Uh, my friend Odai has shared pictures of the residences near his family in Gaza. My friend Evan Fallenberg has shared pictures of his guest house in the Arab area of Acre. He is a Jew uh, running an interfaith guest house, uh, which was vandalized during this latest uh, violence. I recognize that I am an outsider trying to hear several voices and that I don't even begin to know all the facts and that I may have uh, favored some facts over others in the ones that I've shared. But I wonder, how then do we pray? Because none of us know all of it. I want to suggest that we go back into the Ascension story where the disciples are left with the absence of Jesus. And yes, they are described as having expectation and joy, but it is the absence. And it's hard to feel joy when the more you know, the more your heart aches for what is really happening for people. So in the Ascension, as Jesus goes up into the heavens, as we tell it, this is God taking into God's self all the feelings and experiences of being human. Ascension is the full effect of divine empathy with our struggles. God is in us, feeling what we feel. How can this help people who feel God's absence? And by that I mean people who are not religious, people who have lost trust for religion, people who are religious but still have doubts. God knows that we feel the ache of not knowing. God knows that we feel absence. And so we keep on praying. Let's pray about the human cost for ordinary people. Let's pray for the leaders and decision makers. We are on the outside imagining 
and to us it seems to be an absence of wisdom, courage, and compassion. And so let's pray for wisdom, courage, and compassion for all leaders, for leaders in Israel, in Palestine, in Gaza, and moving outward to their dear, nearest neighbors, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Iran, and coming closer to home for us, our Canadian leaders, and the United States, where so much of what will happen hinges, hinges on decisions and funding. Let's pray for wisdom, courage, and compassion, that they will listen to the voices of pain that call for justice. If we do this, we are being consistent with Jesus's own calls for justice, because Jesus represents to us wisdom, compassion, courage. Jesus represents to us God's empathy with where we now find ourselves. Amen. confess the faith of our baptisms as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.